Hi everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Here's a list of do's and don'ts for getting ASHA CEUs. If you're listening to the live webinar today, November 9th, and wish to earn ASHA CEUs for this course, you must attend the entire one-hour session. The handout and all the forms you need to complete to obtain CE credit will be emailed to you after the webinar. You can also find them posted today on speechandlanguage.com. If you click on today's webinar, it will take you to the place where you can download the forms. Be sure and mail the ASHA participant form and the evaluation form to the address shown at the bottom of this slide. The post forms must be postmarked by November 18, 2016. If you're meeting in a group, so there, if there's more than one person at your location, download the attendance sheet and have each person requesting CEUs sign the sheet and complete the forms. If you're a, the only person online, you don't need to complete that attendance sheet. No CEUs are offered for the recording of the session that will be posted later on our website. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Wigg, who will be presenting this morning. Hello, uh, this is Elizabeth, and I am honored that you are taking time today to be with me. We are going to talk about the uh, causing of the bridge to the metalinguistic awareness level and to let uh, metalinguistic skills. And here we go. First, we'll go definitions. Then I will go to will emphasize school age and adolescent development and the relationship with language disorders and metalinguistics. Uh, metalinguistics, and you may have heard this before, but I think it's good to repeat it, is demonstrated when a student exhibits the ability to talk about, analyze, and think about language independent of the concrete meanings of each word or expression. So it, better, it is basically being able to stand back from what is said and say, is this figurative? Is this humor? Is this sarcasm? Uh, is there some implicit meaning here that where I need to make inferences? What is going on here? Basically then, it's an analytical skill. When we go to uh, metalinguistic awareness, I like to have you try uh, yourself out on crossing the bridge by thinking of the many meanings of the word bridge. For example, what do you see in your mind? What do you think about immediately? Is it concrete? Is it a local bridge? Uh, do you extend to other contexts, for example, the Golden Bridge, the London Bridge, the other, other Golden Gate Bridge, London Bridge, other bridges? Can you extend to games, for example, such as London Bridge is falling down? And can you then go into the abstract figurative, the bridge between the U.S. and Russia is 10 years? Can you ever bridge the generation gap? Don't burn all your bridges. I hope that you followed along and that your mind went through a process because it is that process that we are planning to develop in the students with language disorders. You can distinguish between two aspects of metalinguistic skills. One is the epilinguistic capacity of actually monitoring the speech production and what you say. Metalinguistic awareness is basically seeing words as decontextualized objects. You can manipulate them. You can analyze them apart from the meaning content and the production. Metalinguistic awareness fortunately has in its foundation in something we know about in semantics, syntactic, and pragmatic linguistic awareness and knowledge. 
if we look at the child who is about to cross the bridge to metalinguistic functioning, uh, the developmental stage, stage three, that is, is appropriate to look at is from ages six to ten, where the student begins to take listener perspective and use language forms to match that perspective. Uh, not only just stylistic in terms of informal, formal, but also do I express concern, uh, should I be assertive, what should I do? The student understands that words can have two meanings, as in verbal humor, that involves linguistic ambiguity, such as, we, as riddles. Uh, the student can resolve ambiguity as in lexical ambiguity that we find in homophones, in deep structure ambiguities that we find is, for example, will you join me in a bowl of soup? I wouldn't. Anyway, it's phonological morphemic, and this is one of Wayne's contributions. What do you have if you put three ducks in a box? A box of quackers. Now, another thing is, that students can resequence language elements, such as in using Pig Latin. Also in the stage four, ages 10 and up, students extend language meaning into hypothetical realms. They begin to think about possibilities and hypotheses and what is going, what could happen, and so on, and applications to other situations. They understand figurative language, such as metaphors, similes, parodies, analogies, etc. And they can manipulate speech styles or genres uh, to fit contexts and listeners, and the genres are primarily in writing. As we then go, up, go on, we see that metalinguistic inadequacy and language disorders are part of the same coin. We find that many students with language disorders who have received language intervention and who have established the fundamentals of semantic, syntactic, and pragmatic knowledge may not have acquired adequate metalinguistic awareness in the process. They may still show inadequacies in terms of semantic flexibility, that is, using words with multiple meanings and different word uses, abstract, concrete, syntactic flexibility, paraphrasing, indirect uses, and so on. On cell five, these students often perform in the average or low average range, and so they may no longer qualify for intervention. However, they may not have crossed the bridge to metalinguistic awareness and metacognitive abilities that are separate from linguistic skills. They have not paid the toll. There are some metalinguistic difficulties that I am sure you have seen, just as Wayne and I have seen them recognizing syllable, word, phrase, clause, and sentence boundaries. Playing with language can be a problem. Analyzing and talking about language. Planning for the production of statements, questions, paragraphs, stories in speaking or writing. Self-monitoring, self-correcting, and editing speech and writing. Identifying inefficient communication, approaches and behaviors making inferences, predictions, and forming hypotheses, and problem solving. And problem solving is really a rather important part that we'll go back to. We know that reading comprehension and metalinguistic skills are strongly linked. We can teach uh, students to use language as a tool, and that is important for literacy development. We can also teach multiple meanings and ambiguity detection skills to third graders, and when we do it, we find that it improves reading comprehension. Metalinguistic facility is essential in the writing process for the 
initial planning and production composition for editing as writers choose words, analyze intense, and access syntax for both functions. Now let us take a very quick look at a girl called Kim uh, that shows how we might evaluate whether metalinguistic awareness has been established or is beginning to emerge. Self-5 metalinguistics, um, Wayne Secord and Elizabeth Wiig's test, focuses on the evaluation of metalinguistic awareness by ability to talk about, analyze, and think about language independently of the concrete meanings. The student has to make the very important shift from content or meaning to form or linguistic expression. Now, Kim is a nine-year-old girl. She is running into problems with reading comprehension and writing. Her grades are failing in language arts and sciences, and one of the things that a uh, school psychologist would immediately say, what about her cognitive ability? Well, here are Kim's data, verbal comprehension, perceptual reasoning, normal range, processing speed um, on the cusp of normal. Working memory, however, is indeed in the at-risk range. Now, are, are the reading difficulties related to phonological skills or retrieval deficits? Well, when we do the KTEA3, phonological processing is within normal range. Rapid automatic naming is in the at-risk range. When we then look at an academic test, the Wyatt 3 written expression is 78, and obviously that substantiates that she is at risk for failure. And uh, when we looked at essay composition, there were deficits in grammar and in mechanics. <clears throat> On self five, the core language score was 84. And we can say, yeah, maybe, you know, whatever is going on here, that is a, a low level normal. Receptive language, 90. Expressive language, 75. And there is a significant discrepancy between receptive and expressive. When we get to language content, 95. And uh, when we get to language and memory, 80. So we see the working memory component come up as a limitation. But we see that a strength is in the language content, but remember, Cell 5 tests the concrete level of language comprehension. Now let us go to, and I suppose this is, <clears throat> and this is basically a little bit of a problem here because we are, we should have had the uh, Cell 5 metalinguistics. And basically what we find when we do the self five metalinguistics is or is that we find that the metalinguistics index is seventy two, well below normal. Metapragmatics index is eighty two in the at risk zone and look at the uh, interval for confidence level. The meta semantics index is 73. That means she certainly cannot stand back from the concrete level of interpretation, and she is indeed a candidate for intervention. And I keep pushing the wrong button. That is my problem. In terms of long learning objectives, we would say that uh, we should work on expressive use of compound complex sentences, both in speaking and writing. We should develop conversational and narrative skills for speaking and writing. And we should develop the genres for writing and, of course, also for discussion. We should develop awareness of multiple meanings and ambiguities and 
develop knowledge of idiomatic and figurative language use. Now, as we come to the next level, and this is the level that I will emphasize the most, how do we support strategy acquisition for metalinguistic awareness and skills and strategies? We'll first look at an old taxonomy and levels of knowledge, namely Bloom's taxonomy. Then I will look at strategies for developing semantic flexibility, and then strategies for developing syntactic and conversational flexibility. We're finding that way back, actually in the 80s, uh, the concept of strategic inefficiency was voiced by several people in psychology, uh, special education, and speech and language pathology. It was found that everybody agreed that strategic inefficiency is a central problem in children and adolescents with language and learning disabilities. We also found, and we, then we went back all the way to the 50s, 60s, and 70s, that uh, there was consensus that acquiring cognitive and metalinguistic strategies is a goal-directed activity and that the learner is the driver and must participate actively. Strategy acquisition, then, is a process and it can be directed by an SLP, special educator, a classroom teacher, or a coach. Uh, but throughout everything, the learner must drive the process. As we look at Bloom's taxonomy, it has been developed over the years. And basically, in this model, uh, it is a recursive model, that is, at any level of, pro of, of uh, thinking and reasoning and moving on in the process, the educator can direct the student to return to a lower level and go through the process again. The lowest level is, you must remember, hold something in mind, of course. Then you must process and understand what the facts or the concrete aspects mean. Then you must apply facts, rules, concepts, and ideas to it and break down information into component parts, analyze. You must judge the value of the information or ideas. You must evaluate. And you must combine parts to make a new whole. That is, you must create. And that is basically what we are working on getting our students with language disorders to do. Um, there are several approaches that one can take to, uh, for establishing metalinguistic awareness and strategies. One approach is cognitive mediation. And that is a process in which the educator is a guide for thinking, reasoning, and problem solving. Another approach is to use guided questioning. And that is, of course, the open-ended questions. And Bloom developed a taxonomy of educational questions that are basically WH questions that lead the direction for responding in a learning process. Another thing to use is scaffolding, where we provide a structural context that's to support thinking and responding and by, and by slowly withdrawing the support as success occurs. Acceptance of responses is an important principle. In the process, all the students' responses must have a chance to be evaluated. They cannot be discarded or judged, because that's the other aspect. Don't give signs of negative judgments to a response. Another thing that helps, and that is especially if you are involved in group settings, and that is to initiate and to guide peer and self-evaluation. And another and the last uh, set of 
things that can help is to use visual maps and organizers, structured visual input to facilitate critical thinking. Uh, before we go to, to specific methods, let's look at levels of knowledge and what type of knowledge students with language disorders tend to have. They tend to have factual knowledge of words and their meanings, basic vocabulary that seems to develop the concrete aspects. When it comes to subject-specific terminology, that's where they fall down because now we are going to a more abstract domain of word use. In terms of conceptual knowledge, they very often have limited knowledge of semantic categorization and categories and how to classify uh, the content to form concepts. Another issue is they often do not spontaneously generalize uh, to, uh, or use models or structures so that they become flexible in using expressions. Another thing is the procedural knowledge. Well, uh, that specific domain, linguistic domain skill of using rules and structures, morphology and syntax. That seems to be implicated and seems to be a common. And of course, that leads to syntactic inflexibility or lack of flexibility in using syntax. When it comes to metacognitive knowledge, we find that making inferences, which is a metalinguistic skill, understanding figurative uses, humor, jokes, so on, that is a problem area for practically all of them. Unless we help them, they do not spontaneously cross the bridge to metalinguistics. Another issue is strategic knowledge of approaches to specific linguistic tasks. What, how do we approach, for example, conversation? Uh, what is the underlying stru conversational structure? What are text genres? And that comes, that comes very much into the using discussions for learning, uh, using texts, reading texts for learning, uh, writing different text genres. These are areas of weakness. Now, before I go into the next level, which is uh, to look at some models or uh, illustrations of how one can go about it. I want to say that the models that I present are standalone illustrations of how you can proceed to develop reasoning and metalinguistic strategies across linguistic domains. They're designed, what you see is designed for beginners who need to be guided in a conscious reading process. They are not intended for use one after another. Rather, several models can be used at the same time if the SLP or special educator is working with a spoken or written text. For example, if you use a cartoon series, there might be jokes and you use one strategy. There might be figurative expressions. You use a different strategy. Now, we do know before we go to semantic flexibility that vocabulary knowledge is the best single predictor of reading achievement. We also know that concepts, which is what we strive to develop, are abstractions that are learned from examples or related objects or entities. We learn concepts and form categories by inducing the simplest category from the examples given given, and that is according to the simplicity principle that was, re that was proposed by Feldman in 2003. Another thing that's important to understand is that concepts are connected through associations and nodes that are formed on the basis of shared features. These concepts and nodes are stored in the frontal regions of the temporal lobe. 
and the prefrontal regions of the brain have been implicated in retrieving conceptual information. Now, let us go to semantic uh, flexibility. One of the first issues is to develop word relationships. And the, objection, or the objectives then are to expand the meanings of already existing words that are sitting on the word wall, for example, by forming relationships among different words and their meanings. The first, um, in terms of source materials, uh, it's important to use something that the student can have benefits from immediately. So basically, less upcoming lessons, lectures, texts, stories, or other presentations, and specifically identify, to identify the keywords in those texts because those are the ones the student will need to have, have flexibility in using. And in terms of a procedure, uh, we proceed from forming relationships between the keywords by using association, classification, and compare and contrast. And semantic classification, subgrouping, and reclassification is often something the students really haven't quite learned to handle. They, can't, they often can't see uh, that things can be reclassified depending upon what feature you, you have as the important one. And therefore, it's one of the parts that's important is group the words on the wall, 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 word wall into semantic categories, develop the subgroups, reclassified based on shared features, all of this brings about semantic flexibility. Use compare and contrast strategies. For example, take two or more examples from a semantic class. For example, the dog, the fox, the wolves. How are they alike? How are they different? Uh, in what dimension are they alike? In what dimension are they different? In terms of you know, habitat, in terms of so on and so forth. What are shared and non-shared characteristics? For example, um, it could be tame and wild. I'm going to show an example here, and this is a higher level example. Assume that the keywords today are discussion, negotiation, treaty, and peace. And the problem then would be to say, what do they mean? Which of these can go together, and why? How do the meanings of the two words you've chosen relate to each other for, c through communication, their formal contracts, and so on? How do the words discussion and negotiation relate to the meanings of the words treaty and peace, cause, effect, outcomes, so on and so on? What other words can you think of with meanings that relate to discussion and negotiation? For example, argument, compromise, so on. And then go on, what other words can you think of that relate to treaty? It is often written, and a written agreement, a, pre, um, a, a peace ending of war, and so on. And how do they connect? Can you think of important historical situations, for example, where these words have been used? And obviously, um, this lesson might have to do be a history lesson uh, that I took it from. But let me show you a game that Wayne and I have been playing with, and we call it meaning triangles. And that is that we use uh, game-like activities for building understanding of relationships among words and concepts. And in this one, we call it meaning triangles. The basic format is of using one or more triangles, each of which is used to elicit words and concepts that have relationships to each other. Consider, for example, the triangle for negotiation. Well, here is what you could do if you were asked, just put in words that go with that for negotiation. Well, you could ask, you could demand, you could beg, those were words. 
you can discuss, <laughs> you can, what, there are several others. Anyways, you can also draw the triangle and write, for example, not the word in the middle, but two words at the tips of the triangle and ask the student to come up with two or three words that are related to the two words that are given and then ask for the concept that connects the words. And this is what is important because this is what drives the process of going to abstract levels of, of uh, word meanings and, and basically the whole, the whole area of terminology. Now, you can also change how you start and begin with the concept in the middle, one word at one point of the triangle, or the concept and so on, uh, one related word. There are many ways to play what, I call, what we call the triangle game. Now, multiple meanings are, are, should be developed through a process of identifying and interpreting words and lexically ambigu ambiguous sentences in actual spoken or written text. Again, identify the keywords, homonyms, and the ambiguous sentences that occur in, for example, lessons, lectures, text, or other presentations. And um, the, in the procedure, it is basically to elicit sentences that describe the different situations in which the homonyms can be used, compare and contrast meanings as it is used in contrasting contexts, for example, as references for objects, actions, conditions, and so on, and also how they are used in ambiguous sentences. So now let's look at an illustration of the process. Let's assume that the word glass is a big word featured, uh, featured in, in an upcoming text. <clears throat> now, the first thing is to elicit spontaneous meanings and interpretation. What do you think of when you hear the word glass? Um, then have different contact texts. What does glass refer to when it's used in this situation? For example, show a window and you can use pictures or say the ball broke the window. What are we talking about there? Brainstorm other contexts for the word glass. For example, eyeglasses, containers of various kinds, and so on. Broaden the use of the given word by using it in sentences that relate to various contexts and interpretations where else do we use the word glass? And basically somebody might say, break the glass ceiling. And then we can do continue with figurative uses. Don't throw stone if you, stones if you live in a glass house, for example, or breaking the glass ceiling. As we go to figurative language, we are at yet a higher level. And basically, we are at the level where we're looking at understanding and using idioms, similes, figurative expressions. Again, we look at the source materials and identify which ones are coming up, which ones, for example, will be a part of the curriculum in this year's stories, novels, plays, poetry, or other texts. Again, we identify keywords. Uh, move to giving concrete interpretations, extend the uses across situations, and introduce abstract figurative uses. And here is an example. Here is the sentence, and we go back to the bridge, uh, and uh, that can occur in many texts. We could use other words, too. The, share, the expression in the text happens to be their shared hobby bridges the generation gap between grandfather and grandson. And basically, what does a bridge mean? Where do you find bridges? What does a bridge do in a concrete situation? The issue of connecting two sides. Brainstorm interpretations for 
to bridge a gap. What kind of back gaps can there be in, for example, there could be a gap in a text. For example, some information is missing. You have to bridge the gap to understand the text. You have to form a connection. We have to understand what the connection is between one and the other. And then you can broaden the use of the word to related contexts and interpretations such as burning bridges um, and uh, 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 on both sides, they were on both, they were on either side of the bridge, uh, so on and so forth, a number of things. But there are specific figurative strategies that you can actually teach the, the students immediately. For example, directional terms of any kind, up and ahead, um, are, have, have positive connotations. And so does on top, uh, so does raise anything that is a directional term that has an up direction is, has positive connotations. Anything that has a connotation of down or behind is negative. For example, you lower the standards, things are not looking up. Uh, well, negative of the looking up, I feel down today. Uh, he's on top of the world, but I'm not. I'm glad to have that behind me, so on. And those are some examples. And that is a real payoff strategy to have students understand. There's another strategy, and that applies to practically every, every culture and every language, that there are common concepts that are used in figurative expressions. For example, Time, at least in the Western world, is used as money. So we save time, we run out of time, we waste time, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, now, another concept is that containers hold conditions. For example, my cup runneth over. And because it's over, it's up, and therefore it's good. You really uh, have luck. Now, you can also say the pessimist sees the glass as empty. I see it as half full. So you can.